So the next talk is uh, titled the IPS Compiler Optimizations, Variance and Concrete Efficiency. It is by Yehuda Lindel, Eli Oxman and Benny Pinkes. And uh, Yehuda will be giving the talk. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm going to talk about the IPS compiler. IPS is Ishai, Pravagran, and Sahai. Optimizations, variance, and concrete efficiency, and this joint work with Benny Pinkas and Lee Oxman. In uh, the setting of secure computation, there are two main classes of protocols, information theory and computational. In the information theoretic setting, as we've seen in the previous talk, uh, we use very aesthetic mathematical tools. They're typically uh, very efficient. We obtain security even for an adversary who's computationally unbounded, so that's another advantage. However, we require an honest majority. In fact, even two-thirds majority of our broadcast, and it's impossible to achieve this for uh, a dishonest majority. In contrast, in the computational setting, we use uh, computational hardness and heavy tools for obtaining oblivious transfer, zero-knowledge proofs, commitments, and so on. The adversary is uh, limited to polynomial time. We only achieve that level of security, which is fine in practice. Uh, the advantage is that by using this, we can actually obtain security for any number of corrupted parties, at least if you're willing to forego on the requirement of fairness. So these really two different settings with uh, different trade-offs of what we gain and lose. Another uh, uh, class or another uh, category that we have to look at when we talk about secure computation is what is the power of the adversary, not in terms of its running time, but in terms of the other things that it can do. The most basic model is semi-honest, and here the adversary follows the uh, protocol specification but tries to learn more information than it's allowed to by looking at the transcript and looking at what it receives. In the malicious setting, the adversary and the corrupted parties can basically do anything that they want. So this is, of course, uh, a much stronger uh, security guarantee, and that's what we really would much prefer in practice. A more recent model is called covert adversaries, and here the corrupted parties can again follow any strategy that they wish, but unlike malicious, uh, malicious setting, we don't guarantee that cheating will never succeed. Rather, what we say is that if the adversary tries to cheat, then it's guaranteed to be caught with some probability, maybe a half or nine-tenths or nine-nine over, ten, uh, over 100, whatever, uh, that's a parameter that can be determined. So this models cases where the the, uh, uh, in the real world there'd be some deterrent or punishment if somebody uh, cheated, maybe they'd lose reputation, they'd be thrown out of this, the consortium who's carrying out the computations, and so this may be sufficient. In 1987, uh, when uh, GMW presented their, their uh, uh, construction of secure computation, they actually presented a paradigm or a general way of working. The first step in constructing secure protocols is to construct a protocol that's secure in the presence of semi-honest adversaries. This is somewhat easier because you know what the adversary is going to do in terms of the messages it sends, but you need to check that no information, more information than is allowed is, is, is uh, revealed. This is, is non-trivial, but an easier first step. In the second step, you construct a compiler that takes any protocol that's secure in the presence of semi-honest adversaries, and you translate it or transform it into a protocol that's secure in the presence of malicious adversaries. And they do this by using zero-knowledge proofs and commitments and coin tossing, essentially to have each party prove that it's behaving correctly and doing what it should do. And then once we get that, then essentially each party is semi-honest, and the first step security kicks in. So this is the way the GMW compiler worked. In 2008, Ishai Prabhagaran and Sahai uh, at Crypto presented a completely different type of compiler for obtaining security in the presence of malicious adversaries and for any number of corrupted parties. And that it really works in a completely different way. The building blocks are an information theoretic protocol that's secure in the presence of an honest majority. It doesn't have to be a plain honest majority, it can be two-thirds or, or even greater, similar to what we saw in the previous talk. And also semi-honest protocols for computing uh, uh, small, simple uh, functions like the uh, product, the shares of the product of shares. Again, similar things to what we saw a few minutes ago. The advantages of IPS, and I'll describe how it works in a few minutes, is firstly that it has excellent asymptotic efficiency, and this was uh, discussed in the original paper, but also a year later at TCC in follow-up work by the same authors. It's a completely different way of working. That's always good for the field when we uh, somehow have a construction work which works in a completely different way. Uh, we can learn a lot from that and, and, uh, and, and enrich the field. It's also black box and semi-honest protocols. I won't go into why that's so important, but you can look at their papers for that. The basic idea behind the protocol is to simulate uh, this information theoretic uh, protocol that we start with. 
that requires an honest majority, but we simulate it without actually having an honest majority. And how do we do that? The M parties, uh, real parties who, who need to run the protocol and any number may be corrupted, run small sub-protocols that simulate this large information theoretic protocol. So this information theoretic protocol has servers S1 through SN, and the parties, the real parties, run uh, uh, distributed protocols for each of the instructions of each of the servers. And uh, um, we denote by pi, pi 1 through pi n the, the, the small protocols that they run. So pi i will be a protocol that simulates the instructions of the ith server in the information theoretic large protocol. These servers are virtual, they don't actually exist, they're all in our mind, they're just simulated. And the, uh, this large pi is called the outer protocol. And the small protocols that the parties run are called inner protocols and we call them clients. So this is how it looks graphically. We have the uh, servers uh, uh, that exist in a cloud. Clouds seem to be popular in, in slides these days. Uh, but these are actually not, not cloud computing, but just in your mind. They're virtual, they're not really there. And these two clients down here are running two party protocols. So each time they'll uh, run the instructions of this, but in a distributed way, so yeah, in a secure way, so they don't learn anything more than they should, and everything's correct, and so on and so forth, as we'd like. The main question is what security level is required from these small protocols that the real parties are actually running? If they're secure against malicious parties, then everything's fine, obviously, because that means that nobody can cheat, and that means that the simulation of all the servers is correct and private, and that means that, no, that they're actually, it's actually as if all of the servers are behaving correctly, so of course uh, uh, the, the protocol is secure. In fact, it's as if there are zero corruptions uh, in that protocol. However, the aim of IPS is to actually start with protocols that are secure against a weaker type of adversary. If we're starting with something that's malicious, then it sort of defeats the purpose. We want to start with something weaker, say semi-honest. But this doesn't make any sense if the protocols you're running are secure against semi-honest adversaries. But you have real malicious adversaries, then no security is actually guaranteed and they can be completely broken. So it doesn't seem to work at all. So let's start by considering a variant of IPS that actually appears in our, our paper where the, these small protocols are actually secure against covert adversaries. And remember, that's what we said, that you can cheat. We don't, there's no guarantee that you won't be able to cheat. But if you do try to cheat, it's guaranteed that you'll be caught with some probability. Let's say for here, that's with probability one half. And these actually can be made very efficient. Then in order to cheat in the outer protocol, and this is what the, really the main observation of IPS, you have to cheat in many of these, for the many of these servers, because this outer protocol is resilient for an honest majority. So if only you cheat in only a few, nothing will happen. You have to cheat for at least half of the parties. Uh, and cheating, because cheating in this inner protocol is the only way to make the server deviate, so it's the only way to cheat in the outer protocol. But the covert protocols guarantee that any time you try to cheat, you'll be caught with probability one half. So you have to, if you have to cheat n over two times, and you'll be caught with probability one half each time, then the only chance you have of being going undetected is just with probability two to the minus n over two, which is very, very negligible. It's a very small exponential function, and so therefore you're going to be caught as soon as you try to cheat too much. So you can either cheat, either cheat a little bit, but then the outer protocol, this information theoretic protocol, uh, is secure because it, uh, uh, is, as long as only a minority of the parties are corrupted, everything's fine, or you can try to cheat in many protocols, but then you'll be killed by the covert protocol, the covert guarantees, which will ensure that you'll be detected, and then we'll just stop, and you haven't learned anything yet. And therefore, the protocol that we get is secure against malicious adversaries. IPS wanted something more. They wanted to actually start from semi-honest adversaries. So how can they do that? Because then there's no guarantee. In a semi-honest protocol, you can actually cheat if you're malicious really easily, learn absolutely everything, bias the, bias the protocol output, do whatever you want, and no one will ever know. And that you can actually see by just looking at protocols like YAL. So they introduced this no notion of watching and watch lists. And the observation is that if you um, know the randomness and the inputs that a party is supposed to be using in a given protocol execution, then you can actually check that they do what they're supposed to do. Because you know the exact messages they're supposed to send. You know everything that they know. So you can just check, are they doing what they're supposed to be doing? Um, so that, that what IPS do is they set up this watch list mechanism where each party watches every other party in K out of the N of these executions. So you have N servers and N protocols simulating these N servers, and in K of them you can actually know the randomness of inputs of the other parties and check that they're behaving correctly. This causes other issues relating to corruptions or whatever, but if you choose the parameters correctly, everything is fine. And the main point is that no party knows where it's being watched. Right? So if you don't know where you're being watched, then you have to be careful, because if you try to cheat too much, there's a chance you'll cheat where you're being watched, then you'll be caught, and uh, then, then it'll be back exactly like we talked about with the covert case. Right? 
the covert case, every if every time you cheated, there's a certain probability of being caught, and the same thing here, you can either cheat a little bit, and there's a reasonable chance you won't be caught, but then the outer protocol is resilient to that small amount of cheating. Or you can cheat a lot, but then there's a very good chance you'll be caught on the watch lists and you're dead, and then we're happy, we're secure again against the presence of malicious adversaries. Finally, our results. Uh, so we study this compiler, this uh, uh, new approach, from a number of different angles in order to try and deepen our understanding of it. We, have, we present optimizations for the protocol, for the original IPS constructions to improve its efficiency. We also uh, consider variants of the protocol, uh, as I mentioned, relating to covert adversaries and the connection between covert and semi-honest and malicious. And finally, we also study the concrete efficiency of IPS. I mentioned that it has excellent asymptotic efficiency, but what about something concrete? Not when we have uh, three and a half million uh, 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 parties running uh, uh, a circuit of size 10 billion. Will it be actually uh, uh, efficient for reasonable things that we actually want to run? Starting with the optimizations, and I'm going to go very, very briefly through the results because uh, uh, there, are, there are many, but it's on, in the paper, and also we just recently put the full version on ePrint, so you can see the details there. The first thing we do is we construct a more efficient watch list setup protocol uh, for IPS, and they wanted to go for general assumptions and uh, general results, so they used NEOT, and we use something which relies specifically on the DDH assumption. We get something which is much more efficient, but just uh, in addition to the actual construction, which is more efficient, we obtain a more tight and exact security guarantee regarding what the adversary can do to cheat. This enables us, a gives us a tighter analysis to actually improves the efficiency of everything else in the protocol as well, because when you reduce the uh, 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 possible attack vectors, then you can actually uh, um, simplify the outer protocol, the, or not simplify the outer protocol, but you can have, actually use less servers. Details are in the paper. As our setup is uh, so much more efficient that you can actually also uh, have more flexibility in parameters. You can deal with more servers, thousands or even tens of thousands of servers, uh, something that in the initial uh, IPS uh, uh, protocol, this would very quickly become the actual bottleneck and you wouldn't be able to deal with that, which will then harm your overall efficiency. There are other optimizations in the paper as well. Regarding variants, uh, IPS constructs protocols that are secure in the presence of malicious adversaries from semi-honest adversaries. And as I already mentioned, we use the IPS paradigm to also consider the setting of covert adversaries and understand that in more depth. So the first thing we do is we construct protocols that are secure in the presence of covert adversaries from those that are insecure and semi-honest. This is just like IPS, but we now use very, very few watch lists, and we get a more efficient uh, protocol because there, there are fewer watch lists and fewer servers in the outer protocol. We then go on, and this is exactly what I described earlier on, we show how to construct protocols that are secure in the presence of malicious adversaries from covert adversaries. That I actually explained to you in depth. And the significance of these results are firstly to deepen our understanding of this covert adversarial model, which uh, at least I believe is, is a very realistic one and useful one in practice. And there was an open question from TCC 2010 who showed how to go from semi-honest to covert, but only for the case of an honest majority type protocols, and here we do it for all types of protocols, and also we go from covert to malicious, so we can understand much more how these things fit in. We also obtain a really conceptually and technically simple construction. The transformation from covert to malicious is actually really simple, really intuitive, and very easy, for example, to teach in class and explain to people, which is a big advantage. At least if anyone's, anyone's tried to explain cryptography to anyone, it's not simple. And we also get better asymptotic efficiency for at least some, for, for some specific uh, problems. And again, I'll leave that, that for you to look in the paper. Finally, I'll get to concrete efficiency. One of the things that actually when we started looking at IPS, we really wanted to understand is, is this protocol really efficient or is it just, uh, you know, as when the asymptotics kick in uh, way out there in, in 2050? And the reason, but the problem is no one really knows. And the reason why no one knows how concretely efficient it is is because it has a really, really high level of abstraction. You take some information theoretic out of protocol, which one? You use uh, inner protocols for simulating those uh, steps. Which inner protocols? You can choose almost anything. Uh, the number of servers and watch lists trade off in terms of uh, efficiency and error probability. What's the best to choose? All of these things, when you want to analyze asymptotically, it's quite easy, but when, it, when you want to really understand concretely what's the actual cost, this becomes very, very difficult. Um, just to give an example of why, why things are different in the IPS setting, and we actually, for the, the, the choices of the outer inner protocols, we studied the concrete efficiency of actually those suggested by IPS themselves. But in order to understand why things are different, 
in the uh, IPS protocols, when you want to multiply, do multiplication gates, like what Gilad talked about in the previous talk, these were every multiplication carried out by parties requires, by servers requires actually an inner protocol. And this therefore becomes the most expensive thing. When any protocol says just the server should locally multiply two values, which in the real honest majority setting is a very, very trivial operation, here becomes expensive. And everything else that's done becomes cheap because that these we can do without distributed protocols. So what that means is that you get best efficiency by taking an outer protocol, or take, yeah, by taking an outer protocol that minimizes the number of multiplications that parties have to do. And we can do this using the packed uh, secret sharing methodology, but it just shows you that the most information theoretic, product, information theoretic protocol may not be the best protocol to take in the IPS setting. You have to take something which is actually very well fits into IPS. Uh, another issue that comes up is how many servers should you actually take? And my, in the very beginning, I said, well, you always want to have the smallest number of servers because you have to simulate all of these servers. The more that you are, the more simulation, the more inner protocols, the more work. Obviously, you want to limit this. That seems to be trivial. However, when you start doing the actual concrete analysis, you find out that less servers means that the adversary has to cheat in less protocols in order to get its uh, dishonest majority. And that means that you need more watch lists in order to catch the less cheating. And once you have more watch lists to catch the less cheating, to catch this cheating, then that in turn actually requires you to take more servers in order that you don't have too, you can't have too many watch lists versus servers. And so instantiating IPS correctly and efficiently means finding the, 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 the right balance between these different parameters. And we carried out both an analytic and numeric analysis. So we have some part which is analytical and some part we actually just ran scripts on huge amounts of uh, different parameters to see what the actual costs would be. And we have some rather surprising results. So for the case of two parties and you have an outer protocol with a plain honest majority, uh, 4K servers is optimal. K is the number of watch lists. Now, 3K is asymptotically the same. It looks exactly the same in, the, in terms of the, the, the security guarantees that you're getting. But actually, uh, what will happen is that if you take 3K, you'll end up needing, needing more watch lists and more servers than if you took 4K for a given error probability. So things really are different and, and, uh, uh, and surprising and also very interesting. Other difficulties that arise are that uh, for every function or circuit you want to compute, you actually need to take different parameters and you need to analyze and find optimal parameters for those. I'm going to go through it very briefly. Also, when you change the number of clients, these parameters change and again, you have to come up with optimal parameters and these are difficulties when you actually want to instantiate these things. Uh, just to give you a feeling of what the actual concrete cost is, so if you take an AES type circuit, you want to do oblivious pseudo random function evaluation then uh, we get that for this circuit size, a minimal number of oblivious transfers and multiplications, because these are the, the main uh, uh, bottlenecks, is achieved by taking a block size of n over 73. This block size is the packed secret sharing I talked about. And then for an error of 2 to the minus 40, we came up with these uh, magic numbers, 1,752 servers and 207 watch lists. And the actual cost is this, for two different uh, multiplication protocols, you've got 13.8 13 13 .8 million semi-honest OT, so you can use OT extension, it's not, so bad, not as bad as it looks, uh, and 4.5 billion field multiplications, or 5.5 million OTs and 5.5 billion field And then, you, again, the, you, so what's better? Well, it probably depends on the machine you're using and how you trade off, and is it better at doing hash functions or doing field multiplications? And uh, we carried out actually experimental results on a partial implementations and estimates to see how much this would actually cost. And the big surprise, at least for me, when I, I thought that this would not be efficient for something like this, is that if you're using software-based multiplication, field multiplication, it is quite expensive, 950 seconds. But if you use the new Intel AES chip, which gives you carryless multiplication, so very, very efficient field multiplications, you, this can get down below 100 seconds, which is really competitive uh, in comparison to other protocols out there. And this is without going all the way of really trying to fully optimize everything. We may be a little bit op overly optimistic here, but this seems to be the ballpark, and this tells us that there's real potential for efficiency here. Uh, in conclusion, from our concrete analysis, we believe that IPS may be actually really competitive in practice as well in comparison to the other tools we have out there. And I believe there's even more potential for multi-party where efficient alternatives are much less common. We don't have many efficient alternatives. There are serious obstacles and difficulties in implementing IPS. There's no general protocol that takes any circuit and works, at least not efficiently, because the parameters have to be set and these are difficult. 
But the payoff may be worth it and, and, and more research may yield a way of doing this automatically and, and, and tightly and uh, there's really a lot to be done here. So in summary, we have a deeper understanding of the IPS compiler. We, we uh, studied it within itself in terms of uh, its parameters and its efficiency. Uh, we also studied its relation to covert adversaries and used that as a means to, to understand other, uh, other uh, uh, adversary models. We have also optimizations in the watch list setup and other things. In terms of efficiency and practicality, it is very difficult to specify and implement. You have to, to go far, far down in, in, in this tree of abstractions. But uh, it's worth it, and we can, it seems that we can really get competitive protocols for it. Uh, more understanding is necessary and more work is needed, but uh, uh, we have a whole community here who I'm sure will uh, take up the challenge. And new optimizations may even further improve the situation, and so uh, uh, it seems that this is, uh, has real potential for the future. Thank you. And again, we have to go directly to the next talk.